Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Before we dive into today's show, please smash the subscribe button so you can get notified instantly when our show comes out. Thank you, for you will not want to miss an episode of our true crime stories from around the world that will grab your interest from start to finish. Sit back, relax as Ava will bring you today's episode. Thank you, Eric. Today's episode of the unsolved murders of Russell and Shirley Dermond. Today, we discuss the unsolved murders of Russell and Shirley Dermond. Russell Joseph Dermond, a World War II Navy veteran, married Shirley Wilcox on December 15, 1950. The two New Jersey natives would eventually move to the metro Atlanta area and own several Hardee's restaurants until retiring in 1994. The Dermans would move to the Great Waters Reynolds subdivision, a gated community located about 12 miles northeast of Etonton and some 70 miles southwest of Atlanta. According to their obituaries, Russell loved golf, reading, walking, and enjoyed spending time with his family and friends while Shirley loved crossword puzzles, gardening, and playing bridge. Both were active members of the Oconee Community Church. On May 6, 2014, neighbors of Russell and Shirley Dermond, an elderly couple who lived for 15 years inside the Reynolds Great Waters gated community in Etonton, Georgia, home to some of Putnam County's wealthiest residents, called 911 to report a very gruesome discovery. The body of Russell Dermond, 80 years old, was inside the garage of the couple's 3,200-square-foot home, slumped behind one of their cars. There was something else, though, and I think this was one of the details that initially propelled this case into national headlines. Russell Dermond had been decapitated, and his head was nowhere to be found. Shirley Dermond, who had been married to Russell for 68 years, a retired clock manufacturing executive and fast food franchise, was also missing. Her body would surface some 10 days later, discovered about five miles from their home, by a couple of fishermen on Lake Oconee, and again this is Etonton, Georgia, and Putnam County. It's about a probably a little over 70 miles southeast of Atlanta, Georgia. An autopsy later revealed that Shirley Dermond, 87 years old, was killed by two, possibly three, blows to the head with a blunt object. They were deep wounds, so I've heard many experts say that signals an unmistakably lethal intent. In this case, at first, the murders appeared to be the work of professionals, and I want to say that's pure speculation. 100% speculation, and many said to definitely be cautious in cases like this where you're speculating, whether the killers were professional or not. Local Sheriff Howard Sills of Putnam County said he initially assumed the beheading was meant to send a message. The FBI who got involved almost right away said they couldn't find any connections to the Dermond, sand any of their investigations, and as far as we know the couple had no known enemies. This was a question in particular I saw raised in an article that I read that I thought was interesting, and they asked would seasoned killers again take the risk of transporting Shirley Derman's body, which they clearly didn't want discovered, onto a public lake, and then weigh it down with just a pair of 30-pound cinder blocks. This is just one of the many unanswered questions where this case is concerned. I had so many. Also something I wanted to know. Sheriff Howard Sills has also adamantly said he feels if we're still considering the professional killer theory, he doesn't think they would have spent the time to decapitate Russell Dermond, and this is a direct quote from him. And we're talking about a professional they quoted, shoot you in the head, and leave, so there was gunshot residue found on the collar of Russell Dermond's shirt. We're going to get into why they feel he may have been shot before he was decapitated. There's a lot more to that and an observation for this, that he pulled directly from Sheriff Howard Sills, so I'm going to stop there. I'm clearly getting way too ahead of myself. I spoke with someone who knows way more about this case than I do, esteemed journalist Mark Winnie. 
Mark's insight into the investigation surrounding the Dermans was captivating and keep in mind, it's unsolved so obviously we've got more questions than answers. The Dermans' investigation stands out so. When the case really began, what is an overview of the days leading up to May 6, 2014? For the Dermans had accepted some kind of invite from their neighbors to attend a party, but they never showed up. Howard Sills rowed a boat into the cove where the Dermans lived. Soon after the discovery of Mrs. Derman's body out in the lake, so most of this comes from what Howard Sills has said over the years, and the understanding from him is that on the Thursday before the discovery of the murders, Mr. Derman went to the grocery store, bought bread and cucumbers. He also got an ophthalmological prescription for his wife filled inside the store. That she had an appointment sometime soon with the eye doctor. He also went through the bank drive through Friday. There was an email that Mr. Derman did not open. Before that, Derman played bridge. Since that was widely reported at the time, and then yes, it is the understanding that they had accepted an invitation from their neighbors to attend the Kentucky Derby party on May 3rd. They did not show up. Friends who knew they were supposed to be there tried to call them. They went over there to their house. The door was unlocked, and according to what the sheriff said, Mr. Wynn eventually went in and found Mr. Derman's decapitated body in the garage. It was just a gruesome scene. For the most part, until obviously, they didn't show for this Kentucky Derby party that it was a routine couple of days for the couple until they find Derman's body decapitated. They didn't find Shirley's body right away. Her body floated to the surface in Blanchard County about five or six miles from the house some days later. Immediately, the FBI got involved right away in the case. Later, the sheriff said he called the FBI because decapitation is unusual in this country. As a feature of a homicide, he wanted to know what the FBI knew about the Dermans or might know about them. He talked to the FBI about phone records, although he believed that the sheriff's office obtained the warrants for the phone records, and then eventually in one day. As he related, he had about 20 FBI agents, about 20 detectives, from various sheriff's departments that interviewed about 200 people in the Great Waters neighborhood. In one day, and they also had FBI profilers from Quantico develop a profile. Britt Johnson, the FBI special agent in charge at that time, he used the SAC for the Atlanta Field Division, which covers all of Georgia, and he said that he put agents in Putnam County to investigate. What became the Derman double murder at the request of Sheriff Sills, and he said back in May of 2014, we will be there if we're needed, but he also said it's tailor-made for what the FBI can do for one and manpower to a big mystery in a small community. He said that at that point, he had about 40 people involved, and he said that ranged from agents to evidence experts. Some involved a few hours, some for the duration up to that point, and he also said that the Bureau had brought the expertise of criminal profilers at its behavioral unit. Behavioral Analysis Unit, there's a massive investigation, and hundreds of people are close to 100 people interviewed him. One day, so, as the case began to unfold and just out of curiosity, too, when did the coverage begin? Was it right away when they found their bodies? It was not immediately. It was as soon after. Throughout the course of the investigation, were there any theories that popped up that seemed to maybe stand out to you or seem to be substantial have something to them? The theory that still resonates the most probably is one that Sheriff Sills events in June of 2014. The following month, he said his educated suspicion was at least one of the killers at that house knew Dermans. Not especially well and showed up to steal something that Dermans did not have or could not get. Interesting because Reddit threads have had so many discussions on this case over the years it feels like that could be true that it's someone who didn't know them closely but knew it was a nice neighborhood. So, what did the autopsies ultimately reveal about both of their deaths? The autopsy revealed that she died of blunt force trauma to the head and that he was dead when he was decapitated. Sheriff Sills said that he had known that last fact when he first saw the body, 
He also has indicated there was some gunshot residue on Mr. Derman's shirt, which would indicate that he was shot perhaps in the head and was decapitated maybe to get rid of the ballistic evidence. That may have been still in his head. Interesting, so that kind of evidence, was there anything else at the crime scene or maybe found on Shirley's body? When she surfaced days later, is there any evidence throughout the coverage that would say it had the most impact on the case? Anything that came out that people said, oh my gosh, that must be a clue. That must be a red flag of some kind. They think some of the most compelling evidence is what is not present in the case. Nothing major missing from the house that the sheriff knows of now. Is there jewelry that the authorities and the family don't know about? That's possible, but as far as anything major they knew of was that was missing besides Mr. Derman's head, they were not aware of. The Dermans didn't even have ATM cards. The sheriff found no major amount of money removed from accounts. They had cell phones, but they barely used them. So, this case is to some extent so far about what hasn't turned out. Sheriff Howard Sills has been in law enforcement for almost, what, nearly 50 years, and this is a case that he can't let go of. It's a case that has stuck with him for years. Howard Sills is a powerful personality. He's a powerful intellect. He's almost had a legendary status among fellow Georgia sheriffs. He was the president at one point of the Sheriff's Association, but it has also generated some controversy because he tells it like he sees it. I want people to call, but we've had calls like we saw a boat at 2 o'clock in the morning on the lake. When you see a boat at 2 o'clock in the morning on the lake, but boats are on our lakes late at night, people fish late at night, but we're following up on those. When we got a call, we questioned the people there. He has kicked off some prominent politicians, but he's a very smart guy. Even his enemies would acknowledge that, and he's tough, he's not going to take much guff from anybody, and when he walks into a room, he generally commands that room, and that can even go for a courtroom. He does not think it was some sort of extortion robbery of some sort that the Dermans didn't have or didn't have access to. Maybe there was something somebody wanted. There's more than one perpetrator involved, but most importantly, they still believe somebody knows about this, and they need to tell the sheriffs. The residents that lived in the neighborhood and friends polygraphed Russell and Shirley's kids. No leads, no witnesses, no surveillance footage. However, there was a mystery witness to some extent according to what Sheriff Sills said. What my recollection is that witness could not even say accurately the person who was seen in their backyard resembled that of a male. So, it gave the sheriff's office and the FBI perhaps some tantalizing leads, but nothing that could qualify as an identification interest. They had no known enemies no one that would have been after them. For any other reason that may be like what was said, jewelry or something like that. Well, that would strictly be speculation. I mean, there is no jewelry that the sheriff knows of that's missing, but you know in terms of whether anything was taken from the house, he feels like it would have to be something like that nobody knew about except for the Dermans and the killers. One theory is their son Mark was murdered in a drug deal gone wrong in 2000 that it could have been revenge for something that Mark had been involved in. Sheriff Sills had said nothing came of that. Overall, the house had no forced entry. The house did not appear to be disturbed as if someone was looking for anything. Some things have been sent out, like the towels that were used to soak up and stop the blood from Russell going under the door. They are looking for fingerprints, touch DNA, and a new vacuum technique to gather any foreign material off the towels to analyze, and a few other items to a DNA lab for touch DNA evidence. This case is still ongoing and as of now unsolved. Any info on this cold case, please contact the Sheriff's Department in Putnam County, Georgia. Thank you, Ava, for another interesting show, as always. Thanks for joining us and hope that you enjoyed our latest podcast. Please follow us on the links in our channel page. And leave a review, and again if you did not do already, hit that subscribe button. Thanks again and see you here next time.